Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a deeper look at a game you may have caught footage of on the channel already, Steel Division 2. It's been on my most anticipated lists for a while, and it won't be out until the 2nd of May, but the game is currently going through multiple beta phases in which anybody who has pre-ordered the game can participate. The developers were also kind enough to give me access to the beta phases so that I could cover the game on my channel. I've been going on about Seal Division 2 for a while, I'm a big fan of the War Game series, and the same developer is behind the Steel Division series, and I think these games are a lot of fun. I've got a Humble Bundle affiliate link in the description down below and under the I at the top right corner of the screen if you want to buy the game and want to support the channel as you do. And I have a Discord where I'm hoping to grow a community of Steel Division 2 players of varying skill levels so everybody can have fun and the game can have a long life. I genuinely believe that this is a game that all RTS enthusiasts, and World War II specifically, RTS enthusiasts are likely to enjoy, but I also believe that many people have no clue what's going on when they see a screen like this, like this, or like this, especially if they've never played a game from this series before. So here are 10 things you need to know about Steel Division 2. World War II Eastern Front that's the setting for Steel Division 2, at launch, pitting the Soviets against the Germans and Hungarians. Owners of the first game, Steel Division Normandy 44, will also gain access to various nations and divisions from the first game, and through DLC and expansions, Steel Division 2 is likely to add more nations, divisions, and units that are relevant to the Eastern Front. We know that these can be used in multiplayer games and single-player skirmishes against the AI to fight epic battles across massive battlefields of the Eastern Front, but when it comes to the single-player campaign, it seems that everything focuses on the Soviet offensive operation that followed Operation Overlord by a few weeks. I believe it was called Operation Bagration. Not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Now, this operation was a massive push that devastated the German army and led to the war's end. The campaign, as we've been told, can be played from either side's perspective and should offer a great degree of replayability. It's very possible that future content will include more campaigns as well, but that's just speculation. The dynamic strategic campaign map is one of my favorite things coming to Steel Division 2's single-player campaign. I haven't been able to use it yet, but based on what the developers have described and shown, it sounds like the campaign maps of the War Game series, the lack of which felt like a huge hole in Steel Division Normandy 44, in my opinion. Those of you familiar with the Total War series will see some similarities. This portion of the game represents the bigger picture of the war and offensive at hand, showing you a map of the relevant area where you're able to recruit units, organize battalions, and move them around said map. While there is no base building going on or any city management, you will want to ensure supply lines are kept secure and that your troops are able to resupply to regain action points every two turns. They only have a set number of action points that allow them to move, assault, or perform various other tasks. Now, without a safe supply line, your battalions can become sitting ducks. The terrain you opt to travel through will matter too. Old War game games had each region of the map represented as provinces that you could just hop between province to province, whereas here, the whole map is a bit more fluid, allowing you to fine-tune your approach and choose the terrain you move through for various bonuses and malices. When you finally engage the enemy, you can either auto-resolve the battles to just move on with the campaign, or you can fight it in real time. Massive real-time battles are what truly set these games apart. Whether you're just skirmishing against the AI or you're pitting yourself against players online, you can duke it out on any one of 25 maps at launch, fighting 1v1 or 2v2 or anything up to 10v10. That's right, 10 players on either side fighting over a massive tract of land, bringing in complementary units, coordinating pushes, organizing assaults, and trying to hold the line. The scale of these battles is huge. And while you can watch from up on high to give orders to various units and organize your moves, which is glorious in its own way, you can also zoom right down to the ground to see the action from a pretty intense angle. I'm a big fan of this as an option, especially since there's a replay system to really admire the visuals after you've fought a hard battle. I played a fair number of 1v1s, 3v3s, and 4v4s, and they were tons of fun, especially because of how all the battle systems come together. Control point-based battles are a welcome change to the somewhat free-form frontline system of Normandy 44. Don't get me wrong, I didn't hate the concept of having to push your literal frontline up or down the map, 
but I think I prefer the objective-based system in Steel Division 2 as it allows the developers to create hot zones and direct the players to a degree. This creates more tension, I think, and it means that pushes and pulls have more direct purpose. Strewn across the map are these little circles, and these circles can either be neutral or they can belong to one side or another depending on whose zone of control they are in. The zone of control is pushed by units at the front line and this creates a tense back and forth as the standard game mode has the victor decided by a ticket system. If one side controls more of these points, the other starts to lose tickets. If one side controls many more of these points, the other side loses those tickets faster. A battle can be one-sided forever, suddenly reach a stalemate, and then see a complete reversal. It can be pretty intense. We're also seeing three battle modes. One where you start by deploying far away from each other, at the far ends of the map. One where you are able to deploy right at the middle of the map, right in each other's faces more or less. And then finally one where the defender holds all of the control points and like 90% of the map at the start, while the attacker has to break through the defenses. Now, in some people's opinion, the whole zone of control and the frontline mechanic is a little unfortunate because it gives away where units might be trying to sneak past you and get behind you and pull off a flanking maneuver. And that is true, it feels a little strange that, uh, or rather it feels a little limiting in that way where you aren't able to be as sneaky as you might want, but at the same time I feel like it adds a more intense and action-packed flow to the game because everybody always has an idea of where units are, but they don't know what those units are and how big that contingent might be, so there's still a bit of risk and reward involved. I'm pretty happy with it. We'll see how things evolve over time. Deck building is a key component of these games, and Steel Division 2 makes some important changes over Normandy 44. When you're picking what side you want to play as for a battle, not only do you choose what nation you're fighting for, but you also choose what battle group you're going to bring. The battle group is basically the pool of units from which you can deploy at the start of battle or bring in reinforcements from mid-battle. The first step of making a battle group is determining what division it represents. While the betas have only shown us four divisions so far, we know that the Soviets have nine and the Germans and Hungarians together have nine as well. On top of that are the aforementioned extra divisions that owners of the first game will have access to as well and then divisions will be added almost certainly through DLC down the line too. Divisions come in various classifications, armored, infantry, mechanized, airborne, etc. This classification determines the type and quantity of units available to the battle group and the overall composition of a battle group as well. A tank division, for example, will have more cheap slots for better tanks, while an infantry division will do the same for infantry at the cost of tank presence and might not even have access to higher tier tanks. So you choose a division based on what approach you'd like to take. Then you start picking various unit types to fill out the available slots, each of which cost a certain number of activation points, up to a maximum of 50. You can choose when a unit will become available during the battle, either the first, second, or final third, and you can choose how much experience the unit has as well. These choices will affect the quantity and quality of that specific unit. For some units, you can even choose what transport vehicle brings them to the field, balancing speed, durability, and offensive capabilities. Most transports disappear after the unit dismounts, but if the transport actually has a weapon of its own, like a machine gun, it will stay on the field to be used as an extra unit or as a transport. The game provides you with pre-made battle groups to make life easy, but there's a lot of fun to be had tinkering with your builds and coming up with new strategies to implement. Stats. Lots of stats. These games have all sorts of systems that come together to calculate what happens in the heat of battle, and these systems are what make these games amazing. Whether it's two tanks duking it out and the game looking at accuracy, range, armor penetration and armor thickness, or it's telling your recon unit to hold fire so they stay hidden, there are lots of little details that add a touch of micromanagement to the game, but not to an overwhelming degree, at least in my opinion. Every mistake made can be analyzed and improved upon, and every missed opportunity can be adjusted for. Whether you're sneaking a bunch of anti-tank infantry units through a forest over to a line of tanks, or you're raining hell in the form of cluster bombs from above, or you're cleverly reversing a tank behind a heavy forest to hide it from enemy attacks while presenting its strongest side, there are lots of nifty little details that bring every engagement to life. 
and when there are 600 units fighting over 25 maps just on day one, just with the base game alone, you can bet there are lots of those little nifty details I'm talking about to parse through. Line of Sight is a very crucial mechanic in any game of this type, in my opinion, and Steel Division 2 makes sure to give it the importance it deserves, though it has a pretty mediocre visual representation that seems to be hex-based and fairly slow to reveal. I imagine this will be fixed between the betas before launch, especially because Normandy 44 had a much better visual representation. Now this game also includes elevation as a key part of the conversation, unlike Normandy 44. That means that taking the high ground, whether it's a church tower in a village, or a little hill by the plains, or a little bank next to a flowing river of lava, makes a huge difference. You can spot enemies and fire over buildings and forests, and since many of these units can fire two or more kilometers away, you're seeing some exceptionally long-range engagements. With that kind of range, the clever use of line of sight becomes all the more important, hiding behind dense forests, elevation changes, and buildings to stay safe from enemy fire. Or you can be dropping smoke to block enemy lines of sight as you maneuver down an open corridor, making that a tense exercise in coordination and patience. This importance of line of sight, especially for targeting air support and off-map artillery, means you'll often want to use recon units to sneak behind enemy lines or recon planes to keep an eye on particularly threatening movements at particularly important strategic points. Once again, using complementary units is a key part of these games. Just because one unit can't see the enemy doesn't mean another one can't be used as a spotter so that the first one can fire with its superior weapons. It's beautiful when it works, it's hard to make it work, and that's what makes it feel so good. Chain of Command is a very interesting system that adds another layer of depth to the game without needing to complicate things too much. Certain units that you can bring to the field are leaders or commanders. Leaders support units near them, with their rank determining the range of this support. The support means that units will behave as though they were higher by one rank level, increasing their stats, and they'll also take less suppression damage and will also not surrender. Commanders, meanwhile, boost the rank of any unit near them by two steps and are also able to boost the rank of any leaders within a huge radius. I believe it's somewhere between one and two kilometers by one. So any leader that is within this massive radius adds an extra rank to units near them as a result, buffing them as if they were next to the commander himself. This can set up a massive chain of units as the commander acts as a hub, theoretically sending out orders, while leaders act as relays, sending their support further and further down the map. This support can also be passed between allied units, and since the game is so heavy on the numbers and stats, you can imagine just how much of a difference these leaders and commanders make on the battlefield, especially with the changes ranks can bring. Higher rate of fire, better accuracy, etc, etc. It also makes the commanders and leaders a pretty high-value target. Without a commander or leader, the entire chain breaks and the extra benefits are lost. Supply chains are also worth considering in Steel Division 2 battles. Over time, units will start to run out of ammunition or, in the case of vehicles, they might also take some pretty crippling damage. Thankfully, these things can be fixed using supply vehicles. Utterly defenseless and juicy targets for obvious reasons, these vehicles have to be within a close radius of your units to actually provide support. But if you can get them there, they will have plenty of ammunition and the ability to repair critical damage as well. Do not underestimate these units when building strategies and battle groups. All the artillery in the world is useless if it has no ammunition and you won't be making any tank pushes with destroyed tracks. Rock, paper, scissors. Sort of. All of this complexity and all of these stats and systems really boil down to a rock-paper-scissors type system. I know the game can sound daunting to a newcomer, but that's only because almost all the information you need is presented rather than hidden. Yes, at the core, there's a bit of a rock-paper-scissors system. For example, anti-tank trumps tank and anti-air trumps air. But this rock-paper-scissors system is very recursive. For example, yes, anti-tank trumps tank. But if the anti-tank unit is an infantry unit with a satchel that has to be thrown from 20 meters out, then that tank has plenty of time to take out the anti-tank unit because machine gun trumps infantry. So maybe don't send that infantry unit out in the open running down towards a massive lineup of tanks. Or another example. 
Yes, anti-tank trumps tank. But if the tanks have higher accuracy and have enough armor and were the first to fire, the tank might get the first shots in and again, anti-tank is neutralized. The fact of the matter is, all of the details are given to you and it just takes a little familiarizing yourself with what makes your units tick in order to come out on top. It's not as daunting as it looks. I know, I was terrified when I played my first war game game, but once you start to learn the systems, it all makes sense. It's all a matter of logic. I hope this video gave you some insight into the world of Steel Division 2. I'm very excited for the game and I think there's a lot of multiplayer fun to be had. I'm hoping to get more live streaming and PvP days on the channel as well. And remember, if you're interested, you can pick it up at the link below and you can join our Discord for players who are also interested. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of my channel members and patrons for supporting the channel on a monthly basis, keeping us alive and running smoothly. And a massive thanks goes out to you for watching. Until next time. Cheers.